Okay, now I can see you. You got me now. What What's better, Will? Is is uh, is that better or is that better? That's better. Whatever you did the second time, that's better. Okay. All right, we're live. Um, All right, that's awesome. We'll just let people go in. I'll, I'll end up saving this and sharing it later anyway. Uh, hey, man, okay. thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, yeah. that's a pleasure. I'm gonna, I'm going to introduce you real quick. Yeah. Uh, those that don't know, this is Will Garrido. Uh, Will's been training for over a decade. Uh, yeah. He's worked with police dogs, protection dogs, pet dogs. I believe you've graduated from two dog schools. Is that correct? Yes. I went to US Canine. Um, that was back in 2009. It's a, it's right. a police dog school. And, uh, and then I went to Triple Crown which is now Starmark Academy uh, in 2012. Right, cool. So, and you've worked at two different dog training schools, correct? Well, currently I work at a dog training school, uh, but prior right. to that, I worked at a nope. company and then I worked for a, a big company and a contract in Afghanistan. So that was okay. my school per se. Okay, cool. I thought maybe you worked at USK9 back in the day but I, I was wrong no. there. Okay, no, and no. you handled dogs overseas in Afghanistan. Yes, yep. Yes, sir, I was a trainer there. So I was, uh, I started out as a handler, uh, but then because I was, you know, one of the few Americans, because it's a big contract, so there's a lot of handlers right. from different countries. Um, right. Not many Americans, just a handful of Americans. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was one of the few Americans at this, you know, in this region. And we needed a trainer, so I was the only American in that group uh, that had experience from a dog training school, not just as a handler. So uh, that's gotcha. why I was a trainer there. Cool, cool. Yeah, right and now. a published author. author. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, I got that. And so I got that one. Yes, sir. I got that one, and um, and I got a third one that's going to be released hopefully by the end of the year. Awesome. I so, can't wait. Yeah, I'm, I'm, exci I'm really excited about that third one because um, it's a collaboration of, uh, you know, it's not just me. It's, it's a bunch of other people that have made it awesome. possible. So I'm really pumped about that one. Really good. And anybody that hasn't got these books, I definitely recommend them. Um, even if you're not a dog trainer per se, there's a lot of good information in here that could help you know whether or not you have a good dog trainer or how to hire a good dog trainer plus this one is just fun to read thank you man i appreciate it here. yeah i really Comment really here. appreciate it there's some crazy stuff out there that circulates that's myths about dogs and this sets a lot of that straight yeah um it sure does yeah, so this book right here is actually the reason I asked Will to be here tonight to talk about punishment, corrections, uh, and just pressure in general for dogs because mm – -hmm. can you put the books closer? Yes, I can. Uh, so this is Will's book, Info Every Dog Trainer Should Know, and I did not know all the info in here, by the way and common myths about dog. Um, and, and I'll link these uh, after I post this video, I'll link these out to uh, Amazon where you can buy both of these books. Uh, in your book though, and, and I, I messaged Will after I read his book and I commended him because I've been to several seminars, talked to different dog trainers, been to clubs, uh, not a lot of people are very willing to discuss uh, punishment, pressure, corrections, that kind of thing about dogs. And Will is very open in his book and very honest, and that's really great. It was very refreshing to see that. Um, so Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Dakota's here. Brian Peel's here. I hung out with those two guys all day today, so I'm going to scatter the brain from dealing with them. <laughs> you know what the headaches they are, and uh, Justin, Justin, uh, and Faye. Do you know them? Uh, they trained with Whistle a little bit. They have a Malinois out of Stanton, Texas. Good people. I've talked to them through Messenger. Haven't been able to meet them uh, in person yet, but 
everything I hear is wonderful from all those guys in San Angelo. Uh, nice. So yeah, punishment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that right into it. I'll, I'll start. One of the things I love in your book. And it's the section uh, fast results versus soft approach. Yeah. And yeah. you go through both sides, which is excellent. And you start the solution with advocate for the dog, use pressure once the dog understands what is expected of it, and be transparent with your client. I love that. Yeah. And that's exactly yeah. what I try to do. And I hope that's what I accomplish in my training. Uh, yeah, I'll, it's, I'll uh, you yeah, you know, it's, uh, the, the whole concept of corrections, you know, and if we use punishment, punishment is a very specific word that means a very specific thing in terms of operant conditioning. So in terms of operant conditioning, all punishment means is it's a consequence that will decrease the rate of a behavior. That's punishment exactly. in a nutshell. That's really all that is. Yes. Uh, but where people get it really confused is punishment has such a negative connotation to it. You know, it has a, such a strong social, uh, emotional anchor to it. You know, we, we are conditioned to believe that punishment means, you know, it's bad, right? That punishment right. is always horrible. And uh, in terms of operant conditioning, it's just a consequence that decreases the rate of a behavior. Uh, now, how, how you present that consequence as a dog trainer or really as a dog owner or in general, you know, in any, in any sure. context, it really depends on, on you. Um, so that, that's what punishment actually is. Um, but, you know, when we talk about corrections, corrections aren't necessarily always punishment, right? Corrections uh, can also be for negative reinforcements. Uh, you know, there is pressure involved in, in uh, you know, in reinforcement too. So you know, the, the word corrections and the word punishment sometimes get, you know, lumped in the same category. Which I agree. A lot, of times, a lot of times they are, you know, they are, they truly are. But, um, you know, like a, a, what we consider a correction as dog trainers, sometimes when we do a little pop and release, it's not always to tell the dog, hey, stop doing that. Right. Sometimes it's to activate the dog, right? Sometimes right. it's to let the dog go, hey, dude, let's do that. Yeah. You know, it's to let the dog go, hey, let's do this a little bit faster. You right. know what I mean? And, uh, and that's where I think pressure and corrections and the word punishment get lumped in this weird, you know, category that people don't understand and it sounds ugly and it really doesn't have to be. But at the end of the day, you know, if I am going to use corrections as a, uh, you know, as a, hey, dude, we got to stop that. Uh, like, you know, like I wrote in the book and like you said, I want to make sure that uh, at least a dog has a, somewhat of an idea of what I'm expecting, right? Um, yeah. Ideally. Otherwise, it's unfair. Exactly. You know, and there are some instances in which it just has to get done right away, whether you understand it or not, right? Um, some pretty, pretty extreme cases that is not your everyday dog training scenario. Like for instance, um, you know, crittering, for example, right? Um, you don't want the dog to kill the cat. Uh, snake proofing, for instance, you know, poison proofing, uh, things like that. You know, we, we don't need to show the dog, Hey, the snake is bad. It just, wham, oh, you know, it, it has to be, uh, unconditioned punishment, hard, hard correction. Uh, dog goes, what is that wham? So I'm in some instances where, you know, where you would consider those life-saving scenarios, you know, or very exactly. ex extreme scenarios. Yeah, yes. the correction can be hard and we're doing it for, for the, really for the greater good. Right. But uh, if you look at, you know, well, you know, I'm going to correct my dog for not sitting. First question is, does your dog even know how to sit? You and know? sit in the environment that you're in currently. Exactly. You know, th does your dog really understand what a sit is in, in that more simple context? Yes. And uh, a lot of pet owners, a lot of even dog trainers, unfortunately, you know, they, we think the dog knows how to do it. Right. Um, but what happens is the dog kind of knows how to do it. You know, and if the dog kind of knows how to do it, um, and then I go, you know better, 
that's unfair. Now it's so, totally confused. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's unfair because the dog goes, I think I know how, wham. And the dog goes, I didn't really know what you were asking me to do. Then that's unfair. So I want to make sure, we want to make sure that dog understands it, has a pretty good idea of what it is. Then the correction is more fair. Um, and, uh, and that's where, you know, that's where that, you know, that article, uh, you know, kind of, it kind of goes in that direction. You know, you could do it faster and go, Hey, wham, wham, wham. And the dog kind of learns by default crap. You know, I don't right. want to make mistakes. And yeah. that, that's like the fast approach. Sure. Uh, you know, and then you have like the, the other extreme, which is, which drives me crazy too, yeah. which is, Oh, you know, um, let's, let's check back in three months. I think he knows it. Yeah. Uh, he really, really knows it. He has to know it. Don't say no yet. No, no, no. Don't do that. Um, you know, obviously both extremes are, are not going to take you very far. You want to be somewhere in that middle, which is really where a lot of us aim to be. You know, that's why we call yeah. ourselves balance trainers. Exactly. Uh, you know, we want to be somewhere in that, in that, uh, you know, not on the extremes mm -hmm. and get in the middle and then convey to the client or the person I'm working with, Hey, uh, you know, this is where transparency comes in. Exactly. Uh, yes, there is, you know, there, there are instances in which there will be some discomfort because we're talking now about discipline, yeah. you know, and, and dog training is discipline i mean if you think about it you know if 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 i want my dog to come back to me instead of chasing after the bunny that takes discipline right and, and we know what discipline is discipline is doing something you don't want to do right you know you know you don't get up at five in the morning because you want to some people yeah. do but you know what i mean like no, you go I'm, I'm i have to do this you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's the concept of discipline. There are some things that you don't want to do, but you know you have to do. Because if you right. don't do them, there's a consequence. Exactly. And we don't like we the consequence it, of not doing those things. We make it fun. We show the dog what's expected of them. And then we show the mm -hmm. dog, not only is this fun and expected of you, but also you have to do it every time regardless. I don't care exactly. if something else is more fun than this. You still have yeah. to do this. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I know that bunny looks appealing. Like I know yeah. it'd be fun to have that bunny in your mouth, but I, called you. Come back. Yeah. But I called you. you Period. Know what I mean? yeah. Exact. Non-compromising. Exactly. And, uh, and if I have that non-compromising, consistent uh, attitude about my, you know, my relationship with my dog, that in, in the end, that actually makes the dog happier because he doesn't have to guess. You know, he doesn't have to yeah. guess where he stands with me. Exactly. Uh, it's the guessing. It's all the guesswork of it was okay yesterday. How come it's not okay today? Right. That inconsistency is really what, what uh, you know, what, what's not a good foundation to your relationship. Consistency. Yes. Yeah. Consistency. consistency. I preach consistency. Constantly. Absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. Consistency is, you know, one of the key ingredients there for sure. So I'll, I'll let you know how I try to explain punishment to clients and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, I'm a burn survivor, right? I was on fire when I was a child. You may have seen my scars on my legs yeah, when I've been up there to be boy for you and everything. Yeah. So I have scars, like deep, deep punishment, consequence, hardcore, right? Mm -hmm. But fire is something that everyone knows. Everyone understands yeah. that. Everyone knows it's hot. Everyone's been burned to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't go around just laying our hands on stoves, right? You know, exactly. just, if there's a stove there, you know, like I have to respect that. I, I can't just go placing my hands on it, but we weren't walking around day to day thinking, ah, oh, is a stove going to jump out and get me at any moment? Right. Like that's right. when you've gone overboard. That's, trauma that's mm -hmm. abuse mm -hmm. that's yeah you know yeah. then we're skewing those lines um we received a punishment fire punished us at some point we were burned and we know to respect it and we know how to mm -hmm. act around it and we know not to just be crazy with it mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. most people unless it's been traumatic aren't just walking around looking over their shoulder am i going to get burned am i going to get burned you know, mm -hmm. they live okay. their daily life and they know, and when it's time to be around fire, okay, cool. I know I have to 
I have to respect this thing. Yeah, exactly. And I hope that I makes mean, sense to most people. That makes sense to me. You know, that makes sense to me. That's a, uh, I never heard it explained that way, but it makes sense to me. So that's my uh, personal way that I yeah. look at it because I have ran into the clients and the people that, and, and they see me and they see me with my dogs. And a lot of people have been like, they're surprised that I'm okay with punishment. Mm -hmm. It really surprises them. And that's how it should be. You should be training like that to where when you say, yes, punishment is okay. We need to use this now. They go, what? Yeah, like yeah. You, you, you're you okay with it. Yes, I'm absolutely okay with that. Um, yeah. The unfair part, this is how I had it. I've heard it explained. And I don't remember which trainer I heard this from, but I like it. Imagine mm -hmm. yourself, whatever language you don't speak, you're mm -hmm. in that company, mm -hmm. whether it be German you're in Germany, Fran French, you're in mm -hmm. France, and someone comes up and starts talking to you and you don't understand what they're saying and they just slap you in the face. Mm -hmm. And then they tell you the same thing again and you're like, ah, and they slap you in the face. You're gonna start reading their body language. If they oh, want you to go in that room, they're gonna glance over and you're gonna go, you want me to go over here, okay? And like, yes. just don't hit me anymore. That's the yeah. unfair part. Put yourself in your dog's shoes that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's different language completely. You know, um, you're absolutely correct, and I, and I've I've heard uh, I've heard the language analogy before too, and it's a, I think it's a great analogy because right. uh, we uh, we look at our dogs. You know, I don't mean we as in you and I. I mean like as a society, right? Uh, especially in the U.S., we look at dogs as these little um, fluffy children, and they're supposed to understand what we're saying, and they're supposed to understand what we mean. But at the end of the day, they're, they're animals with a completely different language, completely different way of understanding. Um, and yeah, you're right. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to be that unfair source of pressure that doesn't make sense, you know, whether it's in punishment or whether it's in reinforcement. So in the case of positive punishment or negative reinforcement, I want my pressure to under, to be, to be fair. I want the dog to understand what I'm trying to convey, what I'm trying to communicate to that dog. And um, I mean, yeah, and, and that's perfect. You know, the language barrier example, it's an excellent example. You know, people in general, you know, people don't understand their dogs. It's the truth. Right. People don't understand their dogs. Uh, they think they do, but they, they really don't. And, uh, you know, one of the other things, too, that gets to me about the, uh, the anti-correction people, the no-pressure people, right, the uh, purely positive people. Uh, and and I, I know I'm, I'm putting them all in a big bucket too, and I know it's not always the case, but sure, in sure. general, you know, like if, if about the people that, uh, that go, oh, you know, you should never use pressure. That's terrible. You should never train like that. Those are the people that get frustrated the most. And those are the people that end up being the most unfair to the dog. And they go over I've the had, top. I've had people, uh, students, uh, that have gone to purely positive trainers because that's the job that they had, right? So they went to a purely positive trainer. And I've had three different students over the course of years uh, contact me back and go, Will, dude, uh, so I'm working for this purely positive trainer where we're using gentle leaders, uh, which, by the way, gentle leader is a negative reinforcement tool. Don't right. Anybody lie to you about that, right? But they're like, uh, they're like, yeah, so they don't like to Can use, you, you know, explain what a gentle leader is real quick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. that's a good point. That's a really good point. So gentle leader is a head harness. Um, and it goes around the dog's head. And it operates under the, uh, under the model of where your head goes, your body follows. Right. So you manipulate the dog's head, and it makes it easier for the body to follow. It doesn't always work that way. Right. But that's the premise behind it. So, you know, and it's pressure. These people, what's that? And it's pressure. <laughs> it is pressure, you know, like um, that's negative reinforcement 101. The yes. pressure stops when you go this way. That's negative exactly. reinforcement 101, escape conditioning. So uh, they call me back and they're like, oh, you know, so we're not supposed to say no. We're not supposed to correct, use prongs or anything like that. But they're having us correct the dogs basically yank the dogs with the gentle leader that's bad and i'm thinking that. dude that's like that's way worse yeah. than using any other color. form you might yeah. as well use a prong collar 
<laughs> you know, like the prong collar is at least going to go on the the skin and it's just going to pinch and let go, pinch and let go. And you but don't even have to yank that part. Damn, exactly. You're talking about cranking on the dog's spine. Yes. Right? And, and you look at the, at the uh, long-term consequence that that can have. To me, there is nothing purely positive about that. Right. Uh, the other purely positive thing that I, I don't get is when people go, uh, I, I don't mean to turn this into a rant, I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> but you know, one of the other purely positive things about, um, pos purely positive arguments that I, I can't stand is when people go, oh, you know, we can train dolphins and killer whales with purely positive training. Why do yeah. you need to put a prong call on your dog? And I'm thinking, that's existential. Did you know how inhumane it is to have a yes. whale in a pool to begin with? Yes. Yeah. You know how inhumane it is to have a dolphin in a pool to begin yeah. with? Like, so, don't give me the, you know, don't give me like the, oh, it's, it's good for the animal argument when your yeah. example is having a whale in a pool. You and know? people don't, a lot of people don't realize that's not extra snacks those dolphin and whales are getting from those trainers. That yeah. is their meal. That yeah. is existential food. That is existential food training. That is pressure. You will do this or you will not eat. Are you, are you not going to eat? Exactly. Right. You know, um, also, um, you're, you're teaching behaviors. You're not teaching behavior patterns. Yes. Like my dog has to have behavior patterns. Yes. He can also learn behaviors. Yeah. He can learn how to, you know, he can learn how to ring the doorbell. Right. He can learn how to, uh, you know, how to retrieve um, but that's not a behavior pattern. Right. So, so for the pet people, what Will's talking about is like a behavior is a sit, a down, a retrieve, ring a bell. Behavioral patterns is just be calm in the house. No mm -hmm. play. Chill out. That's yeah. a behavior pattern. When, when somebody knocks, don't lose your mind. Don't, right. You know right. What right. I mean? So you're teaching, you're, when you're teaching whales, you're not teaching them behavior patterns. This is why killer whales have killed their trainers. Yeah, you're not. I mean, this is why when there's, not, when there's a crowd here, you're going to jump here and I'm going to feed you other exactly. than it will. Yeah, this is why um, I think according to OSHA at some point it was uh, I forgot what year it was, but because uh, trainers kept getting killed in the pool by their whale, by the whales, they go, all right, guys, don't go in the pool anymore. This time do your tricks from outside of the pool. So, uh, yeah, you know, using the, the purely positive analogy of, oh, you know, we can train dolphins. I had a client who was a dolphin trainer years ago. So really? that, ought to t that ought to tell you something, right? Right, yeah. So, um, and, and she was very open about it. She was like, you know, I can train dolphins to jump through hoops, but I can't get my two chihuahuas in the control. And, um, well, and, and she, exactly. <laughs> Will has <laughs> a chihuahua, guys. Exactly. Yeah, I do. <laughs> and she was very open about it. She's like, you know, I'm willing to do whatever, you know, which is perfectly fine. And, uh, and, and it worked out. So, um, cool. yeah, I mean, the, I don't, I don't believe you should be in, in this extreme. I don't believe you should be in, in that extreme. And, and then you have, you know, dog training becomes a religion, right? Yes. Why do I want to be here? Why do I want to be here? Why do I want to be here or here? I need to be fluid. I need to work with what works with the dog. What works exactly. with the client. I exactly. need to arm myself with all these tools, get the knowledge, understand what I'm doing, become a professional, know what I'm doing, know what I'm talking about. And then based on everything I know and based on what I have in front of me, this is what we're going to do. Rather than try to fit the dog into a system, I want to fit my system into what the dog needs, right? So uh, going... This extreme, this extreme is never a good thing because right. then it's religion. I, I agree. So, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. There's some tough dogs out there. There's some tough, tough dogs out there that people don't see that Dude, they need a yeah. boot in the butt to say, hey, you got to pay attention here just to get some attention. And yeah, then there's sure. dogs that you would crush, you would break those dogs in half if you put the slightest amount. You got to build those up. And you have to flow, like you said, back and forth and know where you're at. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're talking about a live animal. You know, you're talking yes. about a live animal. You're not talking about a computer, a car, uh, any sort of machinery. You're talking about a live animal. This animal has a history, has a learning history. This animal has 
uh, this has temperament tendencies. This animal has breed tendencies. This Genetic animal, traits. exactly. You know, this animal is uh, is perceiving things and making decisions based on its perception, moment by moment. Uh, right. So you have to be on top of your craft, and you have to really have a good idea of what you're doing. Um, you know, that doesn't mean you have to be an expert. Right. You know, it, it, but, it, but it does mean that you should have some foundation knowledge about, you know, what the dog is, how they communicate, what body language is, and, uh, you know, and operant variables, right? Operant conditioning and understand that um, versus just being a technician, which a lot right. of dog trainers out there, I think, are in that category. They're technicians. They know how to teach, how to, how to teach a sit. They know how to teach a down. They know how to teach a heel. And that's great. You need to be a good technician too, but right. you need to be more than just a technician, um, you know, to be a good dog trainer and to give that family and that dog the best experience possible. I agree. I agree. Uh, and I honestly think that's the major thing I'm still learning as a trainer that I want to get better on uh, is reading the animal on the fly kind of thing. And I mean, that's the dog training gift, right? That's the, uh, it's a skill, you know, like I'm, skill. Still, yeah. I'm still in that, I'm still in that category. You know? So I, think, I have, I have an owner train program and anybody that wants to try to train their own dog, I'm all for that. It's curriculum based mm -hmm. and I got them through it and I've had clients come to me. I, I've had people come to me that ended up not being clients because they wanted to opt for that program because it's cheaper mm -hmm. but they wanted me to guarantee them that they could train their dog like i will be able to train my and i'm like i can't guarantee that i can give you knowledge i can i can hand it to you but i can't guarantee you like i guarantee you if you do a board and train i can get a lot more done with your dog because mm -hmm. i can troubleshoot on the fly i can read the dog better you know i've had more experience there and that's yeah. what makes your dog trainer. Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, and you know, the thing about guarantees too, um, there's only so much guaranteeing you can do in dog training. Cause you know, like you said, in, in board and train, you can guarantee that you will give that dog a hundred percent of you. Yeah. But you can never guarantee that the dog will always respond a certain way because it's an that's animal. Yep. It's an animal. And uh, at the end of the day, it's going to make that decision. You could train I, I, that dog to come back to you a hundred times out of a hundred bunnies. The hundred and one bunny will make that dog go, you know what? No, I don't feel like doing that today. And I am yeah. going to go for the bunny. So, um, you know, guaranteeing uh, in general can be a very, can be a tricky thing when it comes to, again, training live animals. So, um, yeah. And I, I bet you would agree with me on this. I've had for board and train, I've had a full spectrum of dogs from, I cannot believe what I was able to accomplish with this dog in the time it was here to what am I going to do? I need to accomplish more with this dog while it's here. Yeah. And then I have the, have the, this, I have told clients in the past, your dog does not like me. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, not like yeah. me. Uh, I have tried everything and, your dog doesn't like me. <laughs> you know, there are so many variables that go into dog training. You know, like the dogs that are superstars, right? The dogs that you know, yeah. that make make you look good, and you're like, wow, this dog's picking yeah. up really fast. Um, there are plenty of dogs like that. They're very good. Oh yeah, they're, tons. Yeah. They're they're smart. They figure things out. They're social, so they want to work with you already. And then you got the dogs that uh, you know that are uh, not as visible. They're not as social. They're more more independent. Yeah. Um, it takes some more repetitions to get to get things. So, uh, you know, those are variables that are, it could be genetic tendencies. Uh, it could be temperament, a temperament trait, uh, or it could be, you know, learning history, you know? Right. So it could be a number of those things that right. make dog training uh, such an interesting thing because, you know, you're working with live animals here. You're look, working with a live animal. A person is basically bringing is coming to you telling you please help me i have a bad relationship with my dog and right. really that's what they're telling you right right and right. um and then you're like okay let me help you out with your relationship 
let me keep your dog for two, three weeks, four, four weeks, however long, and I'm going to teach your dog these skills. Uh, but then you're looking at it as, okay, I'm teaching the dog these skills, but, you know, I also have this animal right here that also right. has to make some decisions too. I can sure. facilitate, you know, like yeah. making the decisions easier, but at the end of the day, you're an animal, right? You have, you're, you're going to make your own choices. You're going to think a certain way. And sometimes you're going to have dogs, like you said, they're going to take you a little bit longer. Yeah. So. Sorry, yeah. I got you off the subject there a little bit. No, dude. So going back it's to pressure. So yeah. Going back to pressure, you mentioned, uh, you know, pops to activate. Yeah. Yeah. On a leash. Opposed to correct and stop a behavior, you can activate a behavior. And I try to teach that and explain that to people. Um, so the best way I've ever had that explained to me, and it was Pat Stewart uh, from Australia at one of his seminars, he talks about uh, if you played football or played sports, you're going out on the field and a teammate goes, slaps you on the it. rear end. Yeah. And yeah. says, hey, go get them. It's motivating, right? Like yeah. you got hit. You, you, someone yeah. hit you, but it's motivating and it makes yeah. you want to go out and, and do better. That's yeah. what we're using with dogs is like a, hey, come on, man. Let's do this. And, Let's huh. do that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and, and that's where pressure is misunderstood by a lot of people is that it's not always – it doesn't always have to be a, a stop sign, right? Right. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a, a red light. It is also a green light. You know, like, for, right. for example, yeah, the example that you gave on, uh, on activation makes perfect sense. Um, but if you also look at escape conditioning, if, if you think about pressure – and, and it's fundamental uh, value. What pressure is, pressure is a motivator. Think about this. If you have an itch, right? If you have an itch, uh, let's say you have an itch on your neck or on your head, right? What, what, what do you do when you have that itch? You have to scratch it. Right? So that is an activator. That's a motivator, you know? So pressure is not always stop that. Uh, when I have that itch, that's a form of pressure that activates me to do this. And as soon right. as I do this, the pressure goes away. So that's escape conditioning. Yeah. Um, it's just negative reinforcement. And I know that gets a little bit technical, especially for your, uh, you know, for your average client. But right, in, a, right. in, a, in a dog training context, here's how pressure moves the dog to do something. Let's say I'm teaching the dog to sit. Right, and I'm helping him with the leash, and I'm molding him to that sit. What I'm doing is I'm using pressure, right? And that pressure goes away the second the butt hits the ground, and right. that pressure helped this dog get into that position. And after that, I can pay him. I can feed him. I can go right into positive reinforcement. Yeah. But the pressure there, yeah. you know. But the pressure there activated. A behavior and then by doing this again and again and again what happens is the dog starts to learn okay this pressure with the leash up this directional pressure means butt goes on the ground so that pressure was never meant to stop the dog from doing anything that pressure right. was meant to activate to motivate the dog to do something you know um so that's where we we don't um you know we don't understand in general you know your average pet owner doesn't really see that uh right. as uh, how pressure can be a good thing you yeah. know um there are so many things you know and and the thing about pressure too that i you know if you look at pressure pressure is a universal language every animal understands what pressure is absolutely it, it doesn't have to be a kick in the ass you know I'm sorry. Right. Uh, no, you're fine. I say I, okay. <laughs> That's fine. All right. So it doesn't have to be a kick in the butt. You know, pressure can be a push. It can be a pull. It can be, uh, you know, it can be a tap. It could be a pop and release. Uh, all of these things that are in that category of pressure that can help me uh, be, uh, uh, you know, a, a mo much more um, complete dog trainer or dog owner where I can use a bunch of things without being afraid to go, well, I don't want to use pressure because my trainer right. told me not to do that. Or I don't want to use pressure because, you know, it's bad. 
You're uh, you're not going to coax your three year old toddler into the bathtub with cookies. You're going to grab exactly. them by the hand and you're going to take them in there and you're going to pick them up and put them in the bathtub. Exactly, you know, exactly. Um, and then as they become five or six years old, you can say, hey, go get in the bathtub. And they go and get in the bathtub. Exactly, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, pressure, pressure in general, you know, they're not always a stop. They, you know, they do, they do help you with uh, escape conditioning, uh, yes, avoidance sir. conditioning, which are motivators to do something. You know, it's not always knock it off. Um, it can be, and a lot of times it is, but uh, that's not all it is. You know, there's more to it. Right. Right. You know? So another thing you mentioned in your book is you talk about e-callers, and mm -hmm. I'm an ad, I'm an e-caller advocate. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this about me. I've swung back and forth on that pendulum. Mm -hmm. So I was an advocate, completely wrecked a dog a long time ago, like broke a dog with an e-caller with the pressure because I was using it incorrectly. Was completely against e-callers. And now mm -hmm. I love e-callers. Uh, the way I've learned to use e-callers, and I have, uh, uh, I use Dogtras. Uh, I have a Dogtra sound box now that I keep mm -hmm. on the field. So when my clients are out there with me and I'm training my dog, I find it handy to have the sound box out there so they can hear every time I stim my dog. Makes and sense. it amazes people that I stim my dog more when they're accessing their reward than any other time. Just about mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. single time I tell my dog, go get that reward, and they're going vigorously to get that reward, I'm stimming until they access the reward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to show them that like, hey, this sensation, this tapping on your neck, which is what it is, uh, it's a good thing. It means do this more right. than it right. means stop that. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's going back. Come to, to me, do that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's when, that's when pressure doesn't have to mean stop. It exactly. also means go do that. Go do this. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, the, the topic of the e-collar is such a controversial topic. You know, there's legislation on it. Uh, there's a huge push for it. Uh, and it's largely done it's less it's largely pushed you know the legislation of it's largely pushed by people who don't even understand it yeah people who don't know how to use it and i get it you know i completely understand if i was a pet person yeah. um see a product naturally... that you think is slap it on your dog's neck and tell them no and shock them yeah you know like if if i'm a consumer and i don't know yeah i i why would i want to do that to my dog you right know? it makes right. sense to me why there is so much push uh, behind making this thing, you know, making it, um, you know, illegal because, um, you know, because the connotation to, you know, the connotation that you have to, it, you know, that you view it as, it's just not a good thing. But, uh, you know, all the tool is, all the, I'm sorry, all the e-collar is just a tool. You're right. Yeah, it's just a tool. And, and you're very, you're very honest in your book. So there's a lot of e-collar advocates out there that they talk about. Oh no, it's not. It's not for pain. It's not used for pain. It's not used like that. But you're very honest that it is can be very much a pain device. And and you're correct. Um, and I have Absolutely. used it as a punishment device on my dog. Yeah. But exactly. my dog only put their e-collars on and they love it because they know we're going to go train. They know there's good things coming. I can have them off leash and not worry about the time that 101 bunny gets their <laughs> mind and they're like, I'm going for that bunny. Yeah. I can be like, yeah. no, no, I'm serious. You have to come to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, and that's certainly one way to do it. Um, you know, I, how I do the e-collar is to me, I want the e-collar to be like a watch. Yeah, you know, I've like, heard you explain this, and I love it. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So to me, like, I don't want my dog to be collar smart. You know, there are times that I want my dog to be collar smart, and it's only for competition, right? If when the first server comes on, it's go time. Um, but uh, you know, in, in training tool wise, I don't want the e collar to be like, hey, we're gonna put this on so that you know we're gonna go outside. That's my personal belief on it. I yeah. don't, I don't, you know, I don't fault anybody for doing it the other way. They're like, hey, e calling means good things. To me, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make the decision that I'm gonna use an e collar on my dog, that collar is going on every morning and it's coming off every night. 
So that 12, 12 hour. I do window. that. I'm sorry. I do do that. I'm sorry. Perfect. Yeah, no, perfect. Perfect. Um, and so the reason for that, the reason why I wanted to be like a watch and I'm sure you do, you know, I'm sure you do. Yeah. And, um, but uh, you've seen trainers and I have to, and we know some of the same people. And I did that, say it. So, yeah. 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 Uh, that what they do is they put the collar on the dog when they need it. Right. And they take it off when they're done. Yeah. Um, so the reason that I do it the way you do it, which is comes on in the morning, comes off at night is I want it to be a watch. And here's why. Um, have you ever noticed that do you wear a watch every day? I, I don't know. Okay. So here's how you, you probably observe this with people who wear a watch every day. I wear a watch every day. There are times where I, for some reason, forget my watch. Right. And, uh, here's what happens. When people forget their watch, they check their wrist like probably 20 times a day, right? Because here's what happens. They, this is not a uniform to them. Right. This is something, this is part of the daily routine. Right. But when they don't have it on, they act as though they have it on because this has become such a strong habit, has become such a, uh, you know, part of the daily routine that you can't even help it but to go, I don't, I don't have my watch on me. So the reason why, you know, to me, if I'm going to use the e-collar, it's going to be on the dog every morning and it's going to come out at night. It's because um, I want them to, you know, not rely on it, but the time that maybe my e-collar is off or the time that, you know, my e-collar is dead, whatever the reason, right? I want them to act as though they have it. You right. know what I mean? It's because it's just on constantly. Uh, I've had clients, as, as I'm sure you have too, that what they do is they, uh, you know, they threaten their dogs with the e-collar and they go, hey, I'm going to put this on you if you don't behave. And they tell you, you know, well, when, when I put the e-collar on him, he knows and he behaves. Yeah. Well, when you do that's that. That's a problem. You know, right. That's a problem. Exactly. Because then what happens is you turn the e-collar into a uniform. And, uh, you know, and not a good uniform, right? Like, you know, in some cases, it's a Prison. good uniform. <laughs> yeah, in some cases, you know, like, um, like I've heard other trainers say similar to what you said is they put the e-collar on and the dog gets excited. Yeah. So it's a good, it's a good uniform. Um, but in the way your average pet owner does it, it's a terrible uniform, right? They put it on that goes, oh, yeah, never mind. I'm not going to screw up. And it gives yeah, yeah, the yeah. owner a false sense of security. Uh, where, you know, is I don't want that to happen. I want this thing to be irrelevant. Um, right. You know, so so yeah. my, my clients that do have e-callers and have gone through e-caller training with me, I do tell them, put it on daily morning, take it Perfect. off at night. And then I also tell them, and this is good advice. So one of the ways that e-caller can actually hurt a dog's neck is by being in the same spot tight yeah. constantly. Yeah. So swap sides daily. That's absolutely correct. Yep. and put it on different sides of the neck. That way the the uh, contacts aren't rubbing the skin, creating sores. Yep. If you Google, like, uh, e-collar burns dog's neck, you will mm -hmm. see dogs that have two marks on their neck. It's yep. not a burn. E-collars, they, they've done tests. It's, and, and unless you yep. get, like, cheap, off-brand, crazy e-collar. The e-collars that are expensive, good, designed for what mm -hmm. we do for – it is impossible for them to burn a dog. Impossible. Neck. Absolutely yeah. impossible. And, you know, though, there are some things that, you know, to me, I'm not a pro e-collar guy. So I'm not like, oh, I love the e-collar. Let's use the e-collar for, you know, this dog and this dog and this dog. I am certainly not like that. But, um, but I do know the e-collar has benefits that no other tool has. You know, Absolutely. one of the biggest benefits of the e-collar is, it's the only tool, right? I mean, if you think about some, some uh, instances in which a dog needs a hard correction, you're talking dog, you know, going after the bunny, right? Dog uh, overpowers chasing the a owner, car. chasing a car, and this dog overpowers the owner. Right. Um, you know, like you could do that with any training. You could do, the, do that with the prong, with the, with the slip collar. But for you to be able to drive that message 
home when this 90 pound dog is after a bunny and Mrs. Jones is like 90 pounds and, and, uh, you know, 75 years old. Yeah. Um, you know, there is no match. Right. Right. Um, and also even if you manage to go, okay, wham, we're going to correct the dog to really drive that message home. You're talking about, you know, potentially, yeah, you could potentially injure a dog, but with the, um, but with the e-collar, it's the only You're tool not. that even if you had to use it at a very high setting, it will not damage the dog in the least. You know, like if you're talking about crittering, uh, right. you know, the dog, I've done this a bunch of times where, uh, you know, I have a, a, a dog that wants to kill the cat. Right? You've had those calls too, I'm sure. Like a dog wants to kill the cat, what do we do? Uh, and it's very prey, predatory uh, oriented. Uh, you know, you're not going to convince the dog to not kill the cat by throwing cookies at it. Right. There has to be that level of discomfort. There has to be that hot heart level of discomfort there uh, for the greater good. Because this is yeah. one of those scenarios that is potentially deadly to a pet. Right. Yeah. So the uh, e-call I is- have seen it done another way. Mm hmm. Uh, but there is no client out there that I know of that's going to put that amount of work into fixing that problem. So I'd be, I'd be really interested to hear that all the way, but uh, not, not that I, not, not that I'm saying I doubt it. Right. I'm sure there's definitely some merit to it, but I'd be interested to hear, to hearing it just so I can kind of see the perspective behind it. But uh, you know, the, the tool that, that allows me to really drive that message home so that the, the cat is safe, the pet, the, you know, the, the house cat is safe and now with his guts, you know, spilled all over the floor. It's for me to give a correction that is convincing enough without damaging the dog. Right. And I can do that with the e-collar. You know, yeah. I can give a hard correction. Um, and then at the end of the correction, know for sure that physically this dog is perfectly okay. Perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I've heard of some old school trainers that, you know, they'll tell you, how did you, uh, you know, how, how did you do the cat proofing? And I'm like, well, you know, had to kick his ass. You know, there's kicking, slamming, helicoptering. And then after yeah. that, you could throw a cat on the dog and the dog would be fine. But I'm thinking, yeah, that worked. But damn, like all the damage yeah, that had to go into that, and that poor animal. Right. That's unnecessary. It's inhumane. Or you could do it like that. You know? Or you could exactly, or you could just do it like that, right? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. not damage the dog. So, uh, you know, the tool, the the e collar is a it's a great tool for that. Um, you know, snake proofing, same thing. Poison proofing, yeah. these are things that the e collar has no match for. Right. You know, e collar has no match for that because it's uh, you know, if you talk about snake proofing, crittering, poison proofing. You can't be involved. You can't go to the dog and go, don't look at the snake, right? right. You can't do that because if you do that, the dog's going to be like, oh, you don't want me to look at the snake. I want to look at the snake. Right. Right. I want it to be non-directional. Um, I don't want it to be connected to me. I want it to be like snake, wham, right? And the e-collar is the one tool that allows me to do that safely and uh, without damaging the dog. Right. I leave uh, the snake alone because when I look at the snake, that hurts. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, it, to me, that's like a life-saving thing that you cannot replicate with another tool, you know, Absolutely. Uh, without getting inhumane. Uh, and same thing for, for poison proofing, crittering, same, same concept, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, right. it's definitely a tool of, uh, that does create a lot of controversy for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool. All right, man. I think we covered a lot there. Yeah. We should, Stacey yeah. Beller jumped on Colton Erber. Er 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 yeah, er yeah, yeah. Colton jumped on. Sorry, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, man, it was great. It was great doing this. I've never done a Facebook live. So awesome. this was, uh, this is my first Facebook live. Glad we could uh, do it together. That was awesome. Thank you. It was, it was a great, it was a great thing to do. Hey, cool. thanks for saying yes, man. I appreciate it. Of course, man. Anytime. Uh, Look forward yeah. to doing it again. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll come up with another, 
yeah. uh, subject and, and hit it again. All right. All right. Thanks, bro. Will. Talk to you we'll later. talk to you Bye. later. Bye. Bye.